We have um, Chantelle Spicer. Uh, Chantelle is a researcher at Simon Fraser University. She is interested in Sunanemoch, First Nation, and their work around Seisuchin Island. Many of us know as Newcastle Island, just off the shore of Nanaimo. And she's both Indigenous herself, but also looks at the issue of how land is shared and how jurisdictions work together or, or perhaps don't work together uh, for these common interests. just want to thank Chantel for joining us. Dennis Thomas, who perhaps some of you are more familiar with, seeing him on, on the site. We've been working with Dennis on two fronts, importantly, with his role as economic development worker at Slayotuth in, in looking at mountains and mudflats and the wildlife corridor and planning together for the barge channel and the development across the street that the Slayotuth are advancing with Darwin. So we've been working with Dennis on that for a few years, looking at best practices. And, and also Dennis, of course, has been running their phenomenal social enterprise, which is called Takaya Tours. And we've been working on a partnership with Takaya Tours with the nursery, with our educational programs. So just great to have both of you today. And I appreciate Dennis, you've got to leave fairly soon. Awesome. Well, hi, Tsapka, everyone. Wana kukwana skui talitsin at slewata tamo. Masteo, I Konasquelo and Kwanzi Kutznala. I just wanted to uh, say thanks to all you respected people. Uh, Wanak is my ancestral name. My English name is Dennis Thomas, and I'm from the Slavic Nation. And it always gives me good feelings inside to to do presentations like this that uh, help represent uh, Slavic Nation. First and foremost, I really just like to honor the matriarchs that we have on on this Zoom from Slavic Nation. My auntie uh, D and uh, my auntie Maureen Thomas and my auntie uh, Carlene Thomas. So, hi, Chika. Thank you, guys. As you know, I run Takai Tours. It's been like that for the last uh, decade or so, and it's something that I really pride myself on because it has really taught me the true essence and, and of our nation's history and culture. And this is something that, it's been around for 20 years, by the way, and I've only been able to run it for half. And so I really just got to raise my hands up to our past leadership who really had the fourth site to think of, a, of a, an ecotourism business. It's the only market ready indigenous canoe and kayak business in all of the lower mainland. So we're still in a niche market. And the purpose of, of Takai Tours was really to put our cultural identity uh, on the map. Everyone thought we were a, a blended First Nation, right? One nation. Uh, unfortunately, there's 203 in BC and 612 in Canada. So we really wanted to make sure that people knew our history as it related to uh, the west side of Secondaro's Bridge. Um, so while running the business of Takai Tours, I've, I've uh, come to know that we have a co-management agreement with the District of North Vancouver. I believe it was signed in 2003, uh, but it took many years prior to that to even have a conversation with the DMV. I know that we have Amanda King online and she might be able to help provide uh, some feedback on that. But for right now, I know that we have a co-management committee where we have uh, uh, Slowitz members on that committee uh, to make uh, decisions or directions as what and should be um, conducted within our summer village of Weiawachin. Um, we also are able to use it for cultural purposes. We're able to use it for our uh, uh, traditional teachings of our canoe racing, of ceremony, and also to have Takai Tours home office on the site of our summer village site. Um, it's such a powerful moment uh, for myself to be running this business. I, you know, I, on an average year, not this year, unfortunately, we had to close the entire business because of COVID. Um, but years prior, we did roughly around 190 cultural tours within our summer village site, um, which is always a, an empowerful moment for uh, myself in particular, but also other indigenous staff of mine, because it's a chance for them to get connected to their culture, um, their indigenous ways uh, of being, you know, our epistemologies, you know, I always like to say that in our indigenous worldviews, because we actually, when we're on the water, we are telling the views of our, of our ancestors. Uh, of our elders and continuing the, the, the transfer of knowledge to our younger uh, mana, our younger kids.
as we relate to, you can step in here too, Erwin, let me know if you want to ask some questions. Um, uh, as it relates to uh, Tom Tamerton, um, the co-management, it's not really called a co-manager, it's cooperation uh, sort of protocol agreement, I believe. It was just signed this year, uh, early this year. Um, and I believe that probably took a long time to establish as well. And the one thing that Takaya Tours did and, and the leadership at that time did was to make sure that we had representation in both of those village sites of Wayawachin and Tam Tameotin. Uh, we had kayak in our canoe offices. We did our cultural tours from both of those sacred sites and to really let people know who the real, who the, you know, the original inhabitants of that area and how important it is for our nation to, to be stewards of our land and to be ambassadors of our culture. And there's also up, up Indian Arm? Yes, uh, we have uh, St. Nathquiam uh, Provincial Park. Uh, I believe it's a partnership with uh, BC Parks. And it allows us to, um, and, I, and I'm connected through um, communication. So for anything for Takai Tours, we have the sole discretion um, to operate throughout all of our territory and to protect our territory from any other competitors um, that are also operating tours and businesses. You know, this is such a sacred area and territory for our nation um, and the pure representation of Takai Tours and what we're trying to do. And uh, when, when any um, other sort of outside tourism companies come up there, uh, they have to first get approval from Takai Tours and our nation. So it's actually a, a very uh, uh, a good relationship that we have with uh, BC Parks. You know, there was a few incidents uh, where some outside tourism, um, trying to be sort of indigenous tourism business that was out of uh, Granite Falls and they can communicate it with Takai Tours right away. And so we had to have that, uh, that conversation on a professional level and um, we're able to, um, as a partnership with BC Parks and Takai Tours and the nation, we're able to uh, remove that company out to make sure that Slowitif uh, and Takai Tours um, business was uh, their, their number one priority. So that was great. And that, that just happened within the last two years. Dennis, um, if we can bring maybe Chantal in now. Um, Chantal, uh, you've been looking at um, um, the situation across the water. It's, it's, it's still Coast Salish uh, lands and waters, of course. And so there's, as Dennis pointed out, there's some similarities, but there's also some significant differences, both in the culture, the histories of the peoples. <clears throat> But uh, if, you, if you want to jump on and um, just explain briefly, uh, just to get things going, what type of co-management arrangements you've seen and witnessed at that site? Yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks for having me here today. And thanks to Dennis for getting us started um, with such a locally specific understanding. Um, so yeah, um, I have been working for the last I guess like 10 years with Snunamook First Nation in some capacity towards the project that is now my master's thesis, um, which looks at understanding how it is that we can center indigenous ceremony, ideology and practices within structures like co-management. Um, so yeah, I think that the examples that Dennis has started us off with are really important in understanding that there really isn't a definition for co-management itself. Um, like there's actually quite a lot of definitions, but I think that it's, it's good that there's this plethora of definitions and, and also like not a definition because it really gets you closer because I think that like the closer that you get to defining what it is, the less context you have for the specific place and the people that you're working with. Um, so yeah, not defining it is good because there's no box that you need to fit into and it allows you to enact, you know, whatever it is that those specific relationships need to be. Um, so with Snanamok, um, I've been looking at Say Sachin or Newcastle Island Marine Provincial Park, um, which is actually a triparate co-management agreement, which is pretty unique within the BC Park structure. So it's an agreement that exists between the Regional District of Nanaimo, BC Parks, and then Snanaimo First Nation itself. 
Um, and within those arrangements, there's like a variety of different relationships that they have with the city of Nanaimo recognizing that co-management relationship as a government to government agreement, but BC Parks recognizing it as a service agreement. Um, so it's really, really different even within the agreement, um, how it is that those parties come to relate to each other. Um, so say such in um, at one time, it's been so it's been a key site in the settlement and colonization of what is now Nanaimo through the extraction of coal. It's also been a sandstone quarry, a herring saltery, a shipyard, a leisure retreat for the wealthy, and then became a park um, in 1955. And it's been co-managed um, with Nanaimo for the last 16 years. Um, and despite it being all of those things, it continues to just be to be, not just be, the traditional territory of Snanamok First Nation, which is both a home and also deeply sacred. Um, so yeah, it's a really, really complex relationship that's there, which all of them should be. Um, so it's primarily under the jurisdiction of the BC Parks Act, given its status as a, as a uh, provincial park, but it also intersects with reconciliation and protocol agreements within uh, the city of Nanaimo and Nanaimo relationships. Um, so yeah, the, the way that the co-management agreement is actually enacted is primarily through um, the park operator agreement, which is this massive 200 page binder that's updated yearly um, and has everything to do with um, basically how it is that the that the park is maintained from picnic tables to the totem pole that you see on the screen here and also around the experience of visitors of uh, say Sachin. So at this time, there's there's very little space uh, for Snanamok to be able to enact their own goals and ideologies through the co-management agreement. But elders and you know many decades of leadership has have recognized say Sachin as a portal to the nation being able to enact their sovereignty and also you know like Dennis had said like really place their identity in the land. Um, through through that land so yeah i could go on and on about it it's it's so interesting but yeah. still there's there's other aspects to talk about and maybe we can get um another question in with with dennis before he leaves uh and then we can come back uh chantel and have a, a group discussion as well dennis you 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 use the word epistemology um for folks who who aren't familiar with that word can you just go in a little bit more about um how how you see the opportunity, how can two cultures find common ground and, and what are those systems uh, that inform, you know, how we, how we learn this knowledge and how we, you know, I, I gave the example, I think Kevin Bell mentioned it one time, when, when we saved, when we saved the Maplewood Flats, we, we essentially stole it from the Slavichoth for the second time, right? That's a, that's a very kind of simple way that Kevin taught me to, to, to understand this the beautiful thing about protecting it from industrial development, but at the same time, the, the assumptions that went behind thinking that we were saving it or the, the, the objective of the Crown, the federal government to do this may, and we never asked Slavotuth. So how is it that these two worldviews can, can be in, at one point so dissimilar, but also potentially be similar? Any, any thoughts on, 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 on your word that you introduced, epistemology and? Sure. Yeah, no, I just uh, learned that word uh, two months ago in my uh, my master's course, my master's program at SFU on Indigenous business leadership. And the very first course that we did was leadership and teamwork. And it was based out of the Maori, the Maori New Zealands, the original people of New Zealand, and their waka, which is the canoe. And our culture is very, It's it was just so mind-blowing how in depth and how connected I was with that reading of that book and reading how they are changing their political agendas to match the Maori's culture. And they visualize that in a canoe. And I'm gonna try and give you guys an example. The Western society, European ways of learning and traditional education was so linear. Divide, conquer, top down, linear the ways of indigenous teachings is is the collective will of everyone within your community and the people around you and sphere intelligence 
So when we're in a canoe, you don't want to go from point A to point B. That's too linear. That's Western science. You know, the way that we do it with our, our sphere intelligence is we monitor the wind. We judge the current. We see if there's actual uh, weather different patterns and we ride the back eddies. We eventually thinking sphere intelligence, the indigenous world views of, of being will get to point B faster than the linear thinking. Mm -hmm. And that's what we need to be doing. We need to be harnessing the indigenous worldviews, but blending it, right? But encapsulating our traditional uh, ways of being. And when, when those two worlds happen, the, the collective society and the social well-being of everyone is, is better, you know? and happier and it comes from a place from from sincere warmth and and uh and just being happy of this area you know and and i really connected with that because i'm i've run this business for 10 years i've been going on travel canoe journeys for five years and i've went up and down coast salish territory from here all the way to south of seattle it took me 11 days and without the modern technologies and instruments of GPS and, you know, depth, depth finders, you know, if you were actually really to be in an ocean going canoe and just reading the currents, reading the elements, reading the, you know, the, the Maori, they read the stars, they read the cosmos, they read um, sometimes the different types of bird, the homing birds that come by, if, if we're the direction that they're going, there's landfall. Like, can you imagine out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean going on a sea, on a wayfinding experience? And if they miss that specific ancestral knowledge that was passed down to them for thousands of years, then they're gone, right? Um, and for us, we're able to read certain land points and landmarks and read the, the currents. And, and that's how we connected. That's how we connected with other different families and our, our kingship to many different coastal Salish nations. So when I've learned about the epistemology and it's, I had to practice for like a week to how to say it first of all, but you know, <laughs> it was, uh, it was just a profound word that I will, that will be sticking with me for the rest of my life. So I was, I was, I was actually just um, happy to say it in a, an official conversation. Um, but before I go, I really just want to really appreciate you guys for um, inviting me to say a few words um, and um, really allowing, I wish I can stay a little bit longer and, and you know, the film shoots, it's for a, a commercial with Destination Canada. And that's the one very one unique thing about that I take a lot of pride in is making sure that our nation's represent, representation is, is documented and also to take advantage of all of these opportunities that come towards Takai Tours and to give our nation the, the shinest light the shiniest light to let people know who we are. Um, and this will be on a national uh, commercial. So uh, thanks Erwin and thank you everyone for uh, uh, listening to me talk and hope you guys really enjoy this. Uh, it's a beautiful day out there, but I think it's, you know, I'll definitely gonna have to be uh, using my wayfinding experiences on the water as it's all foggy. <laughs> thank you so much, Dennis. On behalf of the board and the membership here at the Wild Bird Trust, uh, so grateful to have your partnership also with Takaya Tours and our educational programs. Uh, it's so, such a, uh, we, the, our membership will see later on how much work we're doing with you and, and the changes that have, have been underway uh, that we're experiencing and, and, and props and, and, and much respect to you and of course your, your team at Sakai Tours for, for helping us unlearn our Western uh, epistemologies that we apply to our restoration and, and our work here at Maplewood Flats and uh, really grateful for your time today as well. Awesome. Hi, Chika. Thank, thank you guys. Hi, Chika. Okay. Um, Chantel, um, now, it's regrettable that Dennis left, but this question is perhaps about what are the benefits, and I'm not, and, and you're not here today to, to give us a masterclass about our business and our business is, is our own business to do with the Slavic Nation and, and, and that's not your expertise or, or your purview. But, but um, just in the context of the socioeconomic benefits of these types of relationships, um, you know, there's complexities around how we see nature and I'm just wondering how you, have you've seen the work that you're studying, these kind of collisions of tourism. I mean, we have 80,000 visitors 
at Maplewood Flats. So one would consider us to be a destination, you know, separate from the ornithology, that there's just simply people come to Maplewood Flats to walk. So there's this, there's this visitor experience. And I know people have understood this island off the shore of Nanaimo, which you said people would go to by boat and, and have, a day, have a day trip. So mm -hmm. how, how does the socioeconomic interests and the tourism and all these things, they seem to be at odds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they, are, they are and they aren't. Um, when I, this would have been mm, like three, three or four, maybe even five years ago, I was having a conversation with um, Elliot Kowaston uh, Whitehill, who is um, from Sunaymoke, and we were, um, this is when I was working with Say Suction and I was doing um, ecological and historical tours for visitors there. Um, and I was talking to him about, you know, how complex it is to share something that is so sacred, um, which is the landscape, but also something that for a long time has been kept very secret, which is the culture of Snanamok, because, you know, like many nations around across Canada, like you had to keep culture's secret because that was the only way to protect it from colonial policy. Um, and we were talking about this and he shared with me that really the, the only way forward for Snanamok is, is to share and to learn how to share in more fulsome ways that correspond, you know, with, with what it is that's meant to be shared. But it's, it's really about how is it that we can learn how to work together? Because if we don't work together, you know, no one is going to survive. Historically, you know, uh, Snanamok has known how to co-management, how to co-manage the land with other nations, with the land itself, you know, within their own, within, within their own national structure. Um, and life was hard and life is hard now, but in different ways. Um, so we really have to think about, you know, how it is that we work together and share and recognize that we're a family and that we're related. And a lot of that, you know, within indigenous ways of knowing things, within synonymous specific ways of knowing things, you can't separate things like the social, the cultural and the economic and spirituality, like all of them are bound together. So we really do have to find ways to honor all of those things together and Snanamok and Slowachuth and all of the nations have much experience in how to do this in a good way because they've literally always been doing it. Um, so yeah, like, like you had said, like it's very difficult for me to speak to, you know, what are the practical steps for you folks with uh, Wild Bird Trust because like they have to be rooted in the ways that Slowachuth knows how to do these things. Um, but in my conversations with folks from Snunemok, you know, they talked about in terms of like employment for their people, that it's really about, it's not about like giving people employment opportunities like jobs. It's really about like providing opportunities for, yes, people to, you know, be able to make money and support their families, but also like recognize their purpose and their gifts through their employment to connect, like help connect people to their landscape, to do their own work of, you know, self-improvement and transformation, which is so important. Um, and, and really like looking at economies and jobs and employment, like well beyond what it is that the colonial structures of economy have, have described thus far. Like, yeah, so there's, there's so much potential. I think maybe I'll ask you one more question and then, and if folks have, uh, questions or I know there's uh, um, ex experts in, in the room as well and, and from mm -hmm. so we welcome everyone's voice. Um, the notion of a level playing field, uh, so, you know, I, I noticed when the District of North Vancouver negotiated with the Slayototh back in 1995 at mm -hmm. Cates Park, which became Weawich in Cates Park, mm -hmm. um, that was the first co-management of a municipal park in British Columbia's history and um, but I don't, I don't, I'm just guessing that that's 1995 and that was 25 years ago and, and the co-management agreement perhaps would be different today. Mm. So I'm just wondering your thoughts and, and we watched the video from Metro Vancouver. Mm -hmm. um, what's the, what, what's, what, what is, what is your observations on level playing field around when people come to the table? What's the importance of a level playing field and, and how might we know what is a level playing field or, or what might be hidden or off the table? 
Yeah, this is this is a very complex question. I feel like we could probably have an hour long conversation and just touch the surface of that question. Um, yeah, so in in conversation in my work with Stanemo, um, what everyone has identified um, as problematic within the co-management agreement that they have really comes down to relationships and the way that their goals and relationships as Nanaymoq people are diminished or marginalized um, within the the way that co-management is being is being done now. And I think that honestly BC Parks recognizes this, um, but due to their own bureaucratic structures, they can't move forward to change it. And I think in that, that while Bird Trust is really lucky and that you have way more freedom and flexibility to put the right things, which are level tooth knowledge um, and relationships at the center of that. Um, so the vast majority about what makes co-management work is relationships and trust. And it's about way more than being favorable or nice to each other, but about being deeply accountable and actually learning what that means to each other, like as the foundation, and that this is an ongoing process and is a constantly unfolding relationship. Um, and I think that in terms of coming to, like trying to have some understanding of what a, whatever a level playing field might look like within that specific situation um it's it's having respect and space for ways of doing and knowing things that aren't necessarily yours um that aren't the way that you've been taught how to know things um and this can mean you know building a world and relationships that actually aren't meant for you um that that are meant for something a little that are meant for something much bigger and i think that you folks do get that that your own management um with with birds and you know the wild bird trust it, it's not actually about the birds though the birds are great and important it's about your relationship to the birds and the practice of being out with the land and making space for the birds as they engage in their own economies that don't have anything to do with you and you recognize the value that they bring to the ecosystem in the world and you support them in doing that and i think that those kinds of ways of like extracting or you know synthesizing that management with co-management in other relationships that we exist in the world um, actually have some really important teachings. I My heart just burst because as you're talking about that, I'm looking at the photo of, of Rob Lisk here on the screen and, and Rob Alexander and uh, and some of the, you know, the, the birders, the ornithologists in the room. And, and when you talked about that autonomy of the birds, that just kind of make my heart swell. When you talk about uh, Chantel, that that notion of that the birds have their own autonomy, can you go further? But I think that that's really like what the heart of my work has been is like raising the awareness that in co-management relationships, you know, co-management relationships that Indigenous peoples around the world have known, is that those management relationships include the land. Um, and include the air and the water and everything that is a part of like the structure of the earth. And I think that, you know, raising up, you know, the agency of, of non-human relations is really integral to doing this work in a good way. Thank you, Chantal. My mom and I are sitting here listening and I was telling her, wow, it's like she was sitting at the table with, with our grandfather, the teachings that you're sharing, the worldview, their perspectives, it just echoes how Sauta, how myself and my siblings have been brought up knowing that relationships are important and not only relationships with other communities, other people, but with the land and the water. So when you talk about birds and their autonomy and their, and their ways of being, what we as human beings have to do is step back and make sure that their, their space, their environment, is protected. So when Indigenous people are, are out there fighting for protecting our rights and interests, it's not just for us as human beings. It is for the entire systems that sustain us. The mudflats and everything, you know, one of our teachings as well as, you know, when the tide goes out, the table is set. And when I work with, um, young children, I'd, I'd ask them, well, what does that mean? 
and then they just get all excited about all the things they could list off that they eat from the sea. So just honoring that relationship and ensuring that our shahelmas, our sacred obligation to protect that is first and foremost. And the, I just want to mention, you know, the Wild Bird Trust has come a really long way. I've been fortunate to be um, asked to be on this board for, I can't remember now, four years. Erwin, so we've moved a long way in such a short time. And I really appreciate all of you being here because you're sharing in this knowledge, you're, you're understanding. I wish we could be in person for one, um, so I could see all your faces and give hugs to those I haven't been able to hug for a long time. Uh, Erwin, Leanne, Paul, Jude, Chloe, I don't know who else is on here. Um, Donna, I don't think I saw Donna on here, but anyway, all good friends over the last four years. Kevin, how did can I miss you? <laughs> anyway, so just thank you so much, Chantel, and understand that uh, the work that Slawatath does is, is again, um, my grandfather used to say, I'm not prejudiced, I'm biased. And it's okay to be biased because I think of my people first. And then our second thought are the other people, the other and the and the, the environments that we live in. So we are never doing this for ourselves. We're doing it for all who live here because all of you chose to live in this beautiful part of the world. So it's all of our obligation to do what we can in the ways that with the gifts and the skills that we have been gifted because we're not all the same and that's a good thing because we need those lawyers we need those accountants we need those dreamers who dream big and we need those organizers who can take those big dreams and make them our reality so we all have an equal responsibility to put our skill sets forward the other thing I want to say, I'm really impressed with um, Dennis and Chantel and all of all of our other Indigenous folks that are moving forward and, and capturing those important tools in the Juanitum world. You know, in that world, if you have some letters behind your name, you know, you get instant recognition. So it's important. And that's his real struggle because you're you're taking those two worldviews, those just paradigms that aren't in sync and you're helping us put them in sync. I think I'll stop there. Thank you, Carly. Thanks everyone. It's been a great morning. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Chantal, it looks like you get the final word on, on our, our presentation here. And um, you've just heard from Carlene who's, um, does a lot of work in the region. Carlene knows very much about the shared experiences of Coast Salish peoples up and down the coast and, and as well as the Salish and the interior Salish uh, because of her travels. Uh, but Chantel, you're also in a way helping us with a bit of a, a broader Coast Salish perspective this morning uh, by sharing the stories from across, across what we refer to as the Georgia Strait. Uh, any final thoughts? Um, yeah, well, I mean, I hope, I hope that it's never final thoughts. Um, mm -hmm. You know, these are ongoing conversations that I know that you folks are going to be having hopefully for years and years and years as we all figure out how to uh, do this work together. Um, I do want to say, Carleen Haichka, like, so honored to hear my words resonate with the words that you have, that your grandfather carried and that you now carry. Thank you so much. Um, and thanks for everybody for being here today. You know, I, I feel like there's a million things that I could say about co-management um, and, you know, whatever it is that reconciliation is supposed to be for us. Um, but I do want to say that in, you know, in my journey of trying to figure out what all of this means is that I have recognized that co-management should be really hard um, and that there's a lot to unlearn. And if you find that the process is easy, then you need to go deeper um, and really get at those assumption and biases and like really start 
you know, the process of like breaking down the colonial ideas and structures that, that we all exist in right now. Um, and that there is lots of hope on the other side of that. I think that you know, one thing that, that I really love about the work that I do is, is that it is about a lot of things, but it's also about hope and that we don't do this work um, without some like radical sense of hope and imagination for the future. So I wish all of you much luck and, and care in that journey um, and to, you know, rely on each other for support in doing this you know i recognize like erwin and carlene have said you know there's just like a multitude of experience and expertise um in in your community so please rely on each other as you continue to do this work so heitzka thank you for having me today um, and good luck with the rest of your meeting today thank you chantelle Thanks for sharing time with us, um, and, and I appreciate you. It's not, not final words, and it would be lovely to have you back, because as you said, we're just actually, you only gave us five minutes of the, that one hour answer, so. Uh. <laughs> oh, yeah, so we're gonna come back. <laughs>